forsake you. Just hold on to your faith. Uh. Trying to call to make an arrangement. Daycare got late fees. Cause dead beats made babies. Never mind the sign on the door that says eviction pending. But you read it before haven't yeah. you? You got your whole armor. Yeah. Be sober and you never let your guy down. But hold on to the master. In order to win, you have to. Wanna be in V I C T O I? Gotta put your game face on, don't be fake though. Go from low to high. It's under the name, just call it the name and you'll be fine. Second Peter 1 and 3 tells us that God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him. I have everything. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Truly tonight, I am honored to be with you tonight. I'm so excited to be here tonight with you in our midweek worship service here at God's House Church. It's just an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be able to bring the word of the Lord to all you who are viewing us tonight. 
I don't count it uh, uh, negatively. I count it as a positive that you have tuned in with us tonight. And we're just excited and delighted. For this is the day that the Lord have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Truly today, I can say that it's been an awesome, great, marvelous day. God has been doing great things in my life. I know he's been doing it in your life as well. And I'm just so grateful just to be in the land of the living once again. Tonight, we're going to go into the word of the Lord in the book of Genesis, chapter number 21. I want you to grab your Bibles. Those of you who don't have not have it handy, get your Bible, turn into Genesis chapter 21. We're going to begin reading in verse 15. But before we get into the word of the Lord, we just want to ask God's blessings upon us tonight. Most kind, gracious fathers, we've come tonight. I pray, God, that you would touch us, open our hearts, our ears, and our spirits to hear from thee and not me. I pray tonight you would give us a word to speak to your people. Help us to disseminate and dispense this word that you've given unto us. Let it be a blessing to each and every one that is hearing and viewing tonight. And Father, we just thank you for this day, this opportunity. And Father, I pray that you administer to the needs upon your hearts of your people. The word that you put in my spirit, let it come forth so that these people that are viewing tonight will hear from thee. These, your children, will be blessed and lifted up in their hearts, their minds, and their spirits. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Truly tonight, as we said, we're in the book of Genesis, chapter number 21. We're finishing up our series, dealing with the pain from other people's decisions. And this has been a series that God has really blessed and showed me some great things out of it. Truly in our land today, we see here in America and even around the world, some decisions that were made just a couple of weeks ago have brought about impacting our lives in great ways. It's brought anger, it's brought turmoil, it's brought distress upon not only just in America, around the world. But you know, these decisions that have been going on, these protests that have been taking place around our country and even around the world. These protests here in America have been great. It's bringing awareness to the social uh, and civil injustices that we as Americans, black Americans, white Americans, even Hispanics and Mexican Americans, Chinese Americans, just Americans in general, that what we go through here in the land of America, but especially those of the minority communities, we've been seeing this take place. But you, what the thing I like about this is, is letting us see that when people can come together, when we unite in mindset, when we unite in hearts and spirits, we can begin to evoke change. You know, so I know these protests have been going on. They've been organized for civil, civil and, 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 and uh, demonstrations. But we see any time some people get together with a mindset and a spirit to bring about change, to bring about a, a renewed mindset and spirit, there's always individuals that are going to infiltrate and cause destruction. But I'm thankful that what's going on is bringing awareness in America. We can forget about those who come with a different mindset because the enemy's always got to get in something that's going to bring about change. But here in America, we're seeing God move. But you know the greatest thing that we can do and that is this, what's going on now is great. It's awesome. You're seeing people over the last two weeks or so who've been united, marching and, 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 and bringing about awareness of what changes need to be taking place in America. But the greatest change that we can do is come November the 3rd, where we can go out and vote. This is what everybody must do under the sound of my voice. Not only you do it, but you need to tell your family members, tell your friends, your co-workers, that November the 3rd is when we really can begin to protest what's been going on in our, governmental, our government, and we can see changes take place if we, the people begin to exercise our constitutional right to get out there and vote. We can put in individuals, forget the party's affiliations, but we need to put in individuals who have the heart, the mind, and the spirit to bring about change that's going to affect and influence our lives in a more positive and uplifting way. November the 3rd, that's what we need to do. Yes, we can continue to protest. Yes, we can continue to bring awareness to what's going on in the land, but the greatest change that we can do is come November the 3rd where everybody, every American can get out and vote and we can put in individuals that will help bring about the change that needs to take place here in the United States of America. Oh, I feel great in my spirit right now. And here we go into the book of Genesis, chapter number 21. I'm going to warn you a fourth time. 
beforehand. God has a word tonight. I just pray that I can dispense the word that he's put into my spirit. We're going to challenge you tonight. Get ready, get ready, get ready, because God has something he wants to say to his people tonight. Genesis chapter number 21, verse number 15. And the word of the Lord says, and the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went, and she sat her down over against him a good way off, and as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thy hand. For I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with drink, with water, and gave the lad drink. Father, we thank you for your word. Bless it right now. Here we see tonight in the word of the Lord, I want to deal with, just for a few moments, under God's instruction. See, sometimes we fail to realize that in dealing with the pain from other people's decisions, there is God's instructions that we are up under in the process. And here in this particular part of the text, we saw last week where we went through a pendulum shift. The text opens up in the book of Genesis chapter number 21 with joy, with gleefulness, with exuberance and exhilaration. But then it moves to a situation where it caused grief, turmoil, and pain. For Abraham, as we saw last week, had to make the decision to follow the leading of the Lord in sending Hagar and Ishmael away, all because of the prideful spirits, mindsets, and hearts of his son Ishmael and his former concubine, Hagar. The Bible lets us know that he had a vision from the Lord that spoke to him. And in this vision, he was troubled before the vision took place. But God spoke to him. It's a powerful thing that when we are in despair, we're in turmoil, we're in disarray, that God will speak to us and give us a calming, soothing word based upon the situation of a decision that we have to make. But here we saw that when he made this decision under the leading of God, that Abraham, he was given a command to send them away, but then there was a promise with it. It lets me see something powerful about how God operates. Anytime God puts you in a predicament or a situation that you have to make a decision, there's always connected with it if you, or in your obedience to what God says, it's connected with it is a promise of a great blessing that's going to come afterwards. The Lord lets us know here in the word that when he sent Hagar and Ishmael away, he let Abraham know in a sense that everything was going to be all right because he said to him in the 13th verse that I'm going to make a great nation out of thy seed through Ishmael. And so Abraham got up early in the morning, the Bible lets us know, and he did what the Lord said. But what got me about this, and I've been dealing with this all week long, it troubled my spirit that the wealthy man and the stature that Abraham had, that he only sent them away, the Bible lets us know, with some bread and some water. I know God has given us in his word that that's all he's, uh, mankind has is, uh, is been given unto us, is that God has promised us bread and water. The jelly, the ham, the eggs, the bacon, that's additives. But all he is required to give to us based upon his word is bread and water. The extras that we get with that bread and water, that's where we got to give him greater praise, greater honor, and greater glory because he's went above and beyond what his word said he would do for us. But what troubled me about the situation was Abraham had more resources available to give unto them. 
But what he did was he just gave them the necessities that they needed to leave the house, but not for the sustainment all the out of the house for the journey that they were about to partake of. As I begin to meditate on it and begin to read about it, it let me see something about Abraham, his relationship with God, and it let me see that God never takes you nowhere you haven't already been. First and foremost, why you say that, preacher? Because when you think about the situations in your life, where you have been and where you're at now, the situations may be the same, but the scenario is the difference. In the word of the Lord, we saw in the 12th chapter of Genesis, God told Abraham to get up and leave his kindred, his family, his land of what he had known and go to a place that God was going to show him. Here we see God telling Abraham now to send out his former concubine, but his son to a place that God has going to have to show them and God is going to take them. But in the process, what I see here is Abraham's faith is now being tested on another level, a place he's been before, but the scenario is different because now it's not Abraham, but it's the child of Abraham and the four concubine. Abraham's heart, if you will, probably was not so much concerned with Hagar as it was with Ishmael, his firstborn, his son, his flesh and blood. But it lets me see something about how God was testing Abraham's faith again. He was just being given the title. He was going to be the father of faith, but now his faith was being tested on him sending out his son and his former concubine. He's, it's a situation where he's been in before, but now it's a different scenario because it's a, involving his son. And as I begin to read this, I said, now Abraham says something probably to himself and to God. He said, Lord, I'm going to do what you told me to do. After much pain, after much travailing of what you told me to do, I'm going to send them out. But, and this is Shelby speaking, not the word of the Lord. I feel in my spirit that God, he said to God, I'm going to send him out with just bread and with just water, but I'm going to put them in your hands. I'm going to trust and believe you to take care of them, for you have been the one to told me to send them away, and I'm going to trust you to be the one to sustain them and to take care of their life. So he sends them away. And the Bible lets us know that here they are wandering in the desert. Here they are in Beersheba, in the desert land. And here they are with just bread and water. And the Bible lets us know that now in verse 15, the water is all gone. And I thought about this here now. Here they are wandering in the desert. You can think about the heat of the desert over there in the Middle East. And I know the temperature was probably booming hot. It's here, hot here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's hot in other parts of the country. But it's probably nothing like it was in that area, in that region of the world, over there in the Middle East where Beersheba is. And here they are, the little water that they had. They had been drinking it to sustain them. But now all the water is gone. And I thought about this mother here. The Bible lets us know that she put her child. He wasn't a child per se. He was a grown man, if you will, about 17, 16, you know, years of age. Not fully grown, but you know, kids nowadays, they think they're grown. And the Bible lets us know there's nothing new under the sun. So I can feel like Ishmael probably thought he was a man. But his mom, being a mother, a protector, lets me see something about the love of a mother. No matter how old a child gets, a mother will always love that child, reach out for that child, sacrifice for that child. Here we see Hagar. She takes her child. She puts him up under a shrub. And the Bible says she leaves her child. She doesn't leave him from the mindset of just deserting him, but she leaves him to steal away for a moment. The Bible lets us know here that she goes a good distance away from him. And while she's there, tears begin to flow. She begins to weep. She begins to cry. And the Bible lets us see here that she said she did not want to see the death of her child. I begin to think about this and think about it as those of us who are parents. We will sacrifice whatever we have to see our children have the best of life, better than what we had, and to enjoy some things of life. Here she was now. She did not want to see her child die. She had dreams. She had aspirations for her child. In this moment, in this time, she failed to realize and remember what God had spoken to her spirit the first time she left Sarah 
and Abraham, when her spirit was foul, when her attitude was foul, and she was, and Sarah told her to go away. She failed to realize that God had spoken to her and told her what he was going to do in the life of Ishmael. But see, sometimes what happens is in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our circumstances and situation, the promises and the word of the Lord is on the back burner because we're so caught up, engrafted, engulfed it in what we're dealing with at the moment we fail to realize and remember what God had spoken to her, to us and so she's at that point in time where she is not remembering and so God has to speak to her and come back to her but what he does here is something powerful to me that I love to say God heard the voice the Bible says of the child in the midst of the mom taking a step away from her child. In the midst of the mother crying and weeping unto the Lord, there is a child here by the name of Ishmael. It lets me see something that in the house of Abraham, Ishmael must have been taught how to cry out and call to God when things begin to get tough. This lets me see something about our responsibilities as parents. That it is up to us to instill in our children the word of the Lord, to instill in us the principles of the word of the Lord. Ishmael, if not Abraham, has spoken to him and let him know that any time you're in need, any time you're in pain, that any, each and every day you need to give God thanks. You need to cry out to God. Let him know how good. Let him know how kind. Let him know how merciful he's been to you. But also when things are get rough, you need to call on God and say, Lord, here am I. I need you to move right now. You know, the song says, I need thee, O Lord, every hour. And see, we as people, we as believers, we need the Lord, but sometimes we don't cry out to God like we need to. But here is a child in the word of the Lord teaching us and showing us that no matter how old or how young, we all need to cry out to the Lord. And the Bible lets us see something. God did not hear right immediately the voice of Hagar, but it was the voice. It was the voice of Ishmael that he heard. But what I like about this here, it lets me see something. That sometimes in this scenario here, in the word of the Lord, that sometimes our pain, many a times, may not be from the decisions we make. But sometimes God puts us in positions and situations where the decisions he makes for our life brings pain to us. I know everything God does is right and it's good. But let me be real with you and you be real with me. Many a times God has called us and challenged us to do stuff and make and make, he's made decisions for our life and he's told us what he wants out of our lives but it's not good at that point in time moment within our spirits. See, sometimes we don't want to be real about situations. Sometimes here in the four walls of the congregation, when we come into the church, we don't want people to know what I'm dealing with, the real pain, the real severity, because we don't want people to look down upon us. But each and every one of us, you know just the decisions God has caused you to make. You know if you're speaking right, from your heart, that everything God has told you to do, you were not in agreement right away. What do you mean by that preacher? Anytime God has called you to do something that challenges you to go above and beyond where you're at, your place of comfortability, your place of familiarity, your place of being right where you feel you should be. But when God says, I want more out of you, I want you to go here, I want you to do this, I'm calling you to a higher calling in the ministry, in the, in the, in the kingdom. It challenges us so that we don't want to agree to it right away. The Bible lets us know. When he called Moses, Moses come just like many of us. He came up with all kind of excuses why he couldn't do what God was calling him to do. When he called Jonah, what did Jonah do? He did like many of us. He heard the call of the Lord. It wasn't right what he wanted to do. So Jonah ran. Many of us have ran because the call of God, the decision he's made for our life, we have the ability to reject or accept what God calls us to do. But the problem with many of us is we don't want to be real sometimes and, and say, Lord, I don't want to do this. And Lord, God, he hears our cries. And what we have to do is we got to speak and talk to God. We tell everybody, talk to him. He's just like a natural man. Cry out to him. Let him know how you feel. But many times we fail to realize 
that I can tell God what I desire, what I don't like. God will not he'll hear my cry, but what God does, he positions me and puts me in a place to where I will accept what he has for my life. But in the beginning of the situation, it's not something that I want to do. Abraham, when God told him to put them out of his house, it grieved his spirit because this was a decision that now was out of his hands. It was a decision that God made. He was under God's instruction and God is telling him to put out Hagar to put out Ishmael to send them away but what I love about it is when God tells you to do something with he gives you a command there is a promise with that command and the promise was that Ishmael would be sustained but not only that he was going to be a great man and a great nation was going to rise out of him because he was the descendant he was the seed of Abraham but it still troubled him and many of you, you're troubled right now with some decisions that God has put you under instruction to do. Your natural man does not want to do it. And this is where we as believers, we got to realize there's going to come a conflict. I don't care how saved you are, how much you read, how much you fast, or how much you pray. When God challenges you and calls you to another level, another dimension, another realm in the spirit, in the kingdom, it causes the natural man and the spirit man to come to battle. And we have to sometimes, we have to step back. And we got to deal with the situation because our feelings, our emotions are involved in the situations. Because we don't want to do what God calls us to do. You know how it is, those of you who have been called to different areas of, in, the, in the kingdom. Your first response was no. Because you knew the severity of what he was calling you to. And see, what we fail to realize, and some of us look at it, we say our inadequacies. I'm not equipped for this. But see, God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies those that he calls. And see, this is where many of us get it twisted and we get it mixed up. That God knows where you're at. He knows your life may not be in right accord. He knows your life might not be where you want it to be, where you know it should be. But he called you for a purpose and a reason to let you see that in spite of your situation, in spite of your circumstances, I can still use you in the kingdom. Look at David, a prime example. David was a man who the Bible lets us know was a man that God loved, a man after God's own heart. But David had a spirit within him. He was a womanizer. He loved women. Look what he did to Bathsheba, how he took her and brought her in his house under false pretenses, if you will. But David had a call on his life. The sin for nature of David did not supersede or override the call upon his life. Those of you out there viewing tonight, the call on your life. Yes, you got some sinful activities maybe going on within you. Yes, your mindset might not be right. But God's calling is greater than the activities that you may be involved in. And because he called you, he will qualify you for the position of where he's going to take you to be a blessing, a benefit, not a detriment to his kingdom. But what we have to do, we have to reconcile within us his instructions, his guidance. Because yes, it will bring pain. Yes, it's going to bring heartache. Because it's something that we may not want to do. Being elevated in ministry, being called in ministry, it challenges us because it takes us out of the place and the comfort that we are used to. And God, in God, we go from depth to depth, from height to height. But many of us, we think about, well, God just called me to be an usher. He's just called me to be a, a greeter. And God has greater things for you. The greeter, the usher, is just the deaconship. It may be just the beginnings of where God wants to take you. And what God does, he's just loosening you up, softening you up for where he really wants to take you. But the problem is with many of us, when he calls, we have to come to that place of reconciling the pain of what the call and the instruction is. And see, Abraham here lets me see, no matter your position in the kingdom, when God calls you, it does cause you to, to travail. It does cause you moments of grief. It does cause you as like a Jonah to run. Because you know what he's called you to, but the thing about it is within you, you haven't reconciled that he, I know I'm not qualified, 
but it's up to him to qualify me. If he calls you, he's going to make you what he needs you to be. You don't have to do nothing but be willing to accept what God has for you and to be open in your spirit to what God is about to do in your life. But what happens here, we see that Hagar, weeping, wailing, but she had a son that the principles of the word he was brought up under the fear and admonition of the Lord. His father instructed him in the ways of God. And, and, and here now the situation was dire. And here Ishmael knew that we don't have nothing else. The water is all gone. And we're in the desert. And here, if God doesn't do it, I'm a dead child. But not only me, but my mother. He cries out to God. And God, the Bible lets us know that God hears the cries of his people. He sees our tears. He feels our pain. He knows where we're at. And he hears this voice of this small lad, if you will, by the name of Ishmael. His voice, his tears, his pain, his prayer, it reaches the footstools of heaven. And God said, I got to see about my child. And so the Bible lets us see that the angel of God called to Hagar, not because of Hagar's actions, if you will, but because of a child. God knew that what he had promised unto his father, Abraham, that he was going to be the seed of a great nation. And therefore, he knew that I have to honor what I spoke to his father, but I hear the son crying out to me. So he goes and he moves up out unto him and he tells the mother not to fear, not to be dismayed, not to no longer have pain or sorrow. But he basically tells her, I got you covered. He told her to fear not, for I've heard the voice of the lad where he is. And I begin to think about this. It's a powerful thing. When God hears our prayers. But as a parent, when you've put in the, and instilled in your children the principles and the word of the Lord, and you tell your children from when they're young, when they're middle-aged, and when they get even older as we grow and we mature in age, you tell them, you put in them, that when you got a problem, when you got a situation in your life, I may not be able to help you, but there's a God that sits high and looks low. And all you got to do is come to him in sincerity and truth. Open up to him. Talk to him and let him know where you're at, what your issue is, your situation, and what you want him to do. And he will do it. And it's a powerful thing here because I know as a parent, I could hear it and see it in the spirit realm. That Hagar probably, when God spoke to her, she was elevated to another dimension of realm. I believe she had a personal praise party because God answered the prayer of her child, but also her prayer. But it wasn't her prayer that got through the kingdom. It was the prayer of Ishmael that God heard. And he moved in upon him. And so she, the Bible lets us know in verse 18, she tells, the Lord tells her, the angel, arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. In the midst of her promise, of, of, in the midst of her pain, a promise was reinvigorated into her spirit. A promise was reintroduced to her that she had heard before. Isn't it a powerful thing? That when we're so engulfed in the situation we're going through, God has already given us a word concerning the situation. But because we're so wrapped up, tangled up in what we're in at the present moment, we fail to realize. But it's great when he brings it back to your remembrance and you can have a celebratory praise because what he said he was going to do, he shall and will do it. Our job is just to trust him and believe it. Abraham here was put to the test. He now had to live up to the title that he was given, the father of faith. He now was put to the test when he had to send out the child and the mother. He sends them away. His love, his compassion for his son now was in a place in the situation where he had to believe God with everything within him. But what he had was in the memory banks of his mind what God did for him. And so Abraham probably said, Lord, if you did it for me, I know you're going to do it for my son because you promised me something out of his life was going to be great. 
And so he had an assurance, but now he's reassuring the mother of the same situation, the same thing, that your son, greatness is upon him and within him. And so don't you fret. Don't you cry. Don't you be in turmoil. I got it covered. Ishmael is going to be fine, and so are you. So he tells her, lift up your head. Look up. I got everything taken care of. Dry your eyes, if you will. Because I got some great things in store for him. What looks like death, what looks like the end, is not the end. But I'm putting you in a place in the position where you're going to see my glory and my honor come out of your lives because you're in the desert. And only me, God Almighty, can bring you out of the desert. But I like here something very powerful in verse 19. And God opened her eyes. And she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with drink and gave the lad drink. She filled the bottle with water and gave him a drink. What got me and moved powerfully is lets you see something about how God moves and operates. Here in the midst of the desert, the Bible lets us see that when she got up off her knees, if you will, when she got through celebrating and praising God for speaking to her son and then speaking to her, answering his prayer and speaking to her, when she opens up her eyes, a miracle had taken place. Now, what we don't know here is where this well of water, was it already there in the desert? Or was this something that God supernaturally put in position to let her see and let the sun see that I got you covered? What I love about it is, is in the midst of God challenging us, he always has a blessing in store for his people. She gets up off her knees. Ishmael gets up off his knees. They dry their eyes. She opens up her eyes and where she sees in front of her is a well of water, living water, sustaining water. Those of you who have been filled with the Holy Ghost, you know how it feels to have a well of water spring up in your soul. I believe with everything within me when Hagar saw this well of water, joy bells began to ring in her soul. I believe she had a dance like never before because out there in the midst of the desert, she saw God moved miraculously in her life. He gave them sustainment. But the pain, see when God brings you to a place in the decision that it, it's going to be painful, but he's got a blessing in store for you. But the test of the situation is, do we trust him as we say we do? See, we as believers, we always talk the talk. That, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I believe you. But when he challenges us, that's when you really see how much we really trust and believe in God. I see a lot of times we make these statements, Lord, I believe him. We get up in church. We want to talk in the corners of the church, in the vestibule, in the front of the sanctuary. And we want to tell everybody, our friends, you know, our, our, our corner preacher friends, about the goodness of the Lord and the things he's done in our life. But the test is when he challenges you outside of the church, in the corners of your house, driving in your car, on your exercise walks or in your exercise room to do something in the kingdom. Is your faith in the place, in the position to say yes, Lord, to thy will and thy way? Immediately, there is a turmoil that takes place. Immediately, there is a no in the spirit because we don't want to accept the challenge. God's instructions that we are up under many times are painful for us to want to deal with. Many times we won't say that. We don't want to let people know where we really are. This is the art that I have against the church because many a times we don't want people to really know where I'm at. We come into the church hurting. We come into the church in pain. 
But instead of letting people know, look, I need some help. I need you to move. And I need you to pray for me. We are hold it within because we want to give the appearance that everything is all right. But this place, the church, is a hospital. It's a hospital for those that are sick. And sometimes the employees of the hospital get sick and need help. Why not in the church of God, the same thing. We're employees in the house of the church of the living God. And we get sick. We get in pain. And we need some help. And we need to cry out for help because we have doctors in the household of faith. We have the preacher. But we have the lay members who labor with you in the pew that God has given the ability to help you in the situation. But if we don't know it, we can't help you. And your help's got to come. You got to speak it. She spoke it, and God blessed her. He's presented to her a well of water. And I begin to think about it. The pain that she was up under, how God shifted it in a moment's notice. You see something, how the power of prayer and praise will move God tremendously and greatly. I don't know who I'm speaking to tonight. But God has put you in a predicament, in a situation where he's, bring, he's brought pain to your life. But I can speak from assurance and I can speak from a surety that if you do as God has spoken, the promise that he's given you to make the move he's told you to do, he's going to bless you exceedingly and abundantly, above and beyond all you can think. Yes, you have made some moves in your life. Your job is going great. You've been given some raises and some promotions. Your house, he's just blessed you with a new house. He's done some great things for, but now he's challenging you. Your challenge to somebody I'm speaking to tonight. You may have to move and go to another part of the country because it's there that God is calling you to do a work. You got to give up some things, but I can guarantee you and let you know that you cannot give up something for God and he will not reward you greatly for you accepting and doing what he's called you to do. But the challenge is, you got to accept and get your mind in the mind of Christ and you got to move as he's leading and guiding you. It may take you a moment. It may take you some time. But what you got to do is you got to be willing as he leads and guides to accept it. No one just automatically accept what God calls them to do. I question the individual that says God called me to do thus and so in the, in the kingdom and immediately jumped out. When you begin to think in your natural mind what God is calling you to do, your natural spirit begins to come. Oh, no, I can't do that. Oh, no, God must have bumped his head. Oh, no, what is he thinking? I'm not worried. I can't do all that. That's not for me. That's not what I signed up for. Yes, I want to live up my life for Christ. Yes, I want to give him praise. I want to give him honor. But I'm not called to the preaching, the teaching ministry. But what you didn't know is God saw it before the foundations of the world. He knew that this day was coming and he knew your response. But what he's going to do, he's going to allow you to operate in your mind. But he's going to get you in the place and the position to you to accept what he's going to call. He's going to have people come up to you who don't know you and say, man, you look like a preacher. You look like a teacher. He may have people come up to you and say, hear you humming and singing. Man, are you a singer at such and such church? Do you go there? He always would bring somebody by to give you confirmation of what he's called you to do. But the pain that you're going through is in accepting because the spirit man and the flesh are at war with one another. But what you got to do is you got to step back and say, Lord, I may not be in my mind qualified. But I know that if you called me, you're going to qualify me for what you would have me to do. It may take you some time to get to that point and that place, but I can guarantee you the pressure you're feeling right now because of the call upon your life. Once you accept what he said for you to do, when you lift your hands and say, Lord, I am ready. I am willing. I don't fully understand it. I don't fully know what you have in store for me other than what you've told me, but I'm willing to walk by faith in what you're calling me to do. And I guarantee you, and I can let you know that there is great blessings in store because God never calls us to do anything in the kingdom without bringing blessings to our life, not only spiritually, but also naturally. 
And see, that's the thing about it is when you make a move for God, he will bless you spiritually and also naturally. But the thing you have to do is you got to resolve in your spirit, in your heart, and in your flesh that what God has called me to do, I got to step out of my flesh and say, yes, Lord, to your will and to your way for my life. Those of you, I don't know who I'm ministering to tonight. You are in some pain because of the decision that God has placed upon your life. You're under God's instruction and the decision that he's called and he's made for your life. It's caused you pain. It's a difference when it's another person's decision that's caused you pain. But when it's God's decision, it's a, it's a different type of pain. It hurts. It challenges you. But the thing about it is, is when you say yes to his decision that may be painful, once you say yes, all the pain is gone. Peace and joy like never before. You'll sleep better than you ever slept before. You'll walk like you, you'll wake up like a feeling like a brand new person. All because you finally reconciled your spirit man and your natural man. You put the flesh under control and now are walking by the spirit, the leading, and the guidance of God. And you know now that the decision that God made, I didn't make it. He made it for my life. And now I can say it's right, but also it's good. Because in the beginning, you know it's right, but you don't know and you can't accept that it's going to be good. But once you reconcile yourself to his will, not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will, but thy will be done. This is where we as believers got to get to the place that we can accept thy will. Not my will. Sometimes our struggles and our issues all because our flesh doesn't want to do the will of God. The spirit man may be willing, but the flesh is weak. And sometimes the spirit man needs that reassurance from God. That's why he always sends confirmation. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And whatever God's called you to do in the kingdom, there will be an establishment by the word coming forth by two or three witnesses to let you know this is not you, but this is God leading and guiding you. And when we accept it, we'll be just like Hagar. Open our eyes and there will be a well of water. It may not be a literal well of water, a figurative well of water for many of us. What it is, is it's the blessings of God for the sustainment of the promise that he's given unto us. But sometimes God puts us in places and positions where he may bring, make pain, bring a painful decision in our life. The painful decision is we got to now do something that we don't want to do. It's challenging us. It's taking us to another realm, another level. Yes, he's given us a promise. And he may even show you in the vision, the dream. Or in the prophetic word that was given to you, what was in store. But until you reconcile your flesh, your will, to his will and his way. Not my will, but thy will. I had to learn that for myself. And those of you that are viewing tonight that have accepted the decision that God made for your life. For his kingdom, for his glory, and for his honor. You realize and you know that it was right. And it was most definitely good because God never calls you to nothing that is not right and is not good for you personally and for the kingdom spiritually. But when you think about what we studied here in this series, the decisions that people make, whether it's us or other individuals connected to our lives, they have an impact upon those within our lives and there's our sphere of influence in our circle. Ishmael, out of this whole process, the decisions that two people, Sarah and Abraham made, through his mother being involved in the decision after the fact, impacted his life 
in a manner and a way where he never had a say so in the decision. But he was blessed because of it. Because of the decisions, he was placed in a position where God used him greatly. And because of his father, he became the father of the Arab nation. He had a brother who is the father, if you will, of the Jewish nation. They're fighting like cats and dogs, all because of law and grace. Flesh and blood cannot get together because of a decision that a man made outside of the call that God had for his life. But it was all in the plan, the divine will of God for the life of Abraham, Hagar, Ishmael, Sarah, and Isaac. Dealing with the pain from other people's decisions, when you look at it, there's a great blessing that will come out of it. But the problem is that we got to walk it out. And this is where many of us fail to realize that my job, my responsibility is to move as he leads and he guides me. It may cause me hurt. It may cause me pain. But in the end, he has a well of water, a well of blessings in store for my obedience, for my sacrifices. Because no matter what I give up for the kingdom's sake, no matter what I give up for a ministry's sake, God will bless me above and beyond what I could do in my natural thinking, in my natural abilities. Because moving within him and doing as he leads in God's, the rewards outweigh the pain because the benefits are greater. But the pain from other people's decisions, we don't think about it, but God knows in the end it's going to work out for our good. So whatever you're dealing with tonight, those of you who are under the sound of my voice, who are viewing, God's got it all worked out. It may be painful in your mind. You're going to have to go through the steps, but it builds character. It builds integrity, but it also gives you a testimony to be a blessing and to be a witness to others who are going to come your way in a painful situation. But what you can do is you can let them know, child, my brother, my sister, what you think you're going through, about to embark upon, I've been in deeper and greater than you. But I can tell you from experience, if you just let God do what he said he was going to do, if you put your will on the back burner and his will in the forefront, you're going to see tremendous blessings. And I'm a living example of what God will do when you allow him to do as he said he was going to do in your life. We as people of God, we as believers, God is doing some great things. This pandemic is a move of God for us as believers because he's now putting us in places and positions where in the midst of the pain that we're going through in the, situ- in the land, there are great blessings in store for us. But all we got to do is just be obedient, make the sacrifice, As again, as I stated earlier, you cannot give unto the Lord and he will not bless you for doing what he asked you to do. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you and bless you tonight. I pray that your word that has come forth has blessed those that you had to hear it tonight. Father, we just thank you and we bless you. And I praise you for the movement in America today. Father, I pray that as things are going across the land, we're praying, we're believing, we're looking for a shift in the land called America, the United States of America. We're looking, we're praying for you to move in the civil injustice, in the social injustice that's been perpetrated upon your people. And we're praying and moving to God that on November 3rd, we as believers and even non-believers are going to stand united to bring about change, Father, through the ballot box. We're protesting civilly and peacefully. But the thing is, is we're going to protest with the vote, the greatest voice that we have. And I thank you in advance for the shift and the move in the United States and across the land. And we thank you for peace. 
We thank you for justice, but most importantly, we thank you for liberty for all men equally created by thee. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. I want to thank you tonight for tuning in with us. We bless you for those who have sat with us this evening over the course of this series we've taught. I pray that it's been a blessing to you. If God gives us the ability and the, and the opportunity, we pray next week God gives us another series that we'll go into to be a blessing to your life. But tonight I want you to sow a seed to the ministry. This week I've been blessed by people who God has touched their hearts to sow to the, into good ground. Here in the city of Albuquerque, we had a business. Don't know them, didn't even, never heard of them, but they were just impressed by the leading of God. They sowed a nice love seed, a seed to the ministry that just touched our hearts. I was let the bishop see it, and he just saw it, and he just was mesmerized by the outpouring of love from our community. Some of the people in the ministry, ministers in the church and, and members of the church have been sharing with me that during this pandemic, this is a time where you can sow and give and see God bless you because he, he's challenging us and you cannot beat God giving. No matter how hard we try, we can't do it. I was with an individual and he spoke to me that during this time and season, he's been giving. And God has been blessing him. And the more he gives, the more God gives to him. And he said, he said, Pastor D, I'm just so encouraged about what God doing. He said, I just want to give. And I'm giving. I'm sowing to the ministry. And I'm sowing into other parts of the, of, the, of, the, of the ministry. And God has just been blessing me. The more I give, the more he's given to me. You can't be God giving. Go to our website and sow a seed. There we got three distinguished categories distinctly set apart that you can give. We have Givelify that you can go on and sow a seed and you can give to the area of ministry that you want to give. We have a PayPal where you can give and you can designate where you want to give and you can sow largely and liberally as God has placed it upon and within your heart. And we also have Cash App where you can just go to dollar sign, God's house church, and you can sow as God has blessed you and has purposed in your heart to give to the ministry. We thank each and every one of you for your giving, and we pray God's blessings upon you. And for those of you who don't want to give through the electronic means, you can still write your checks and send your money orders to God's house church, 2335 Wyoming Boulevard Northeast here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87112. And we, everything that comes electronically and even in the mail, we pray upon it to see God move in your life because of the testimonies that we've been given. We want to hear and read more and more about what God's doing in your life. We're, only, we're not only praying for financial blessings, but we're also praying for natural blessings that God would do sustainment and great things in your life as well. But we we want to thank you for tuning in with us. We want to thank you for sowing into God's house church. And I just want to let you know that this is the place, God's house church, where everybody is somebody and nobody's a stranger. But most importantly, Jesus Christ is Lord of us all. Tune in with us this coming Sunday at 11 a.m. There will be a word from the Lord, a word from heaven that will enrich, bless, uplift, and edify your soul. Be with us this Sunday at 11. Also, so tune with us on Tuesdays at 12 noon where our midweek Bible study takes place and also we have a midweek word and worship service every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Tune in with us here at God's House Church. We thank you, we bless you, and we pray God's great blessing within and upon your life, your families, and those connected with you divinely in the kingdom of God. God bless you and have a great evening. Until we see you again, God be with you. Amen. And we love you with the love of Jesus Christ.